delighted uh, to chair this final high-level uh, debate that concludes our book conference on uh, the framework of new EU-UK relations. Uh, and it is a great pleasure to introduce and uh, welcome virtually at the Brexit Institute of Dublin City University, uh, Ambassador Tom Haney and Sir Ivan Rogers, uh, who are uh, two leading observers and indeed players uh, in uh, the Brexit uh, debate. Uh, both speakers are incredibly uh, well known. Uh, and I think constitutes uh, some of the finest example of the diplomatic corps of uh, Ireland and the United uh, Kingdom. Um, let me just very briefly say something about them. Uh, Tom is currently the permanent representative of Ireland to the uh, European Union. He's a graduate of another Dublin University I cannot mention for obvious reasons of competitions. Uh, jokes aside, uh, he's a graduate of, of UCD. Uh, he's a uh, diplomat with an extensive career and experience having uh, represented uh, Ireland at the international organization in Vienna as a the liaison office in Brussels for NATO and in Geneva for uh, the United Nations. But I also want to mention that Tom uh, was among uh, the many role he had, also the Joint Secretary, Secretary of the North-South uh, Ministerial Council, which is a body uh, established by the uh, Belfast uh, Good Friday uh, Agreement. Uh, Ivan instead uh, is a graduate from Oxford and uh, Ecole Normale uh, Supérieure, and he was the former uh, permanent representative of the United Kingdom uh, to the uh, European Union from 2013 uh, to 2017. Uh, he previously was Europe advisor to Prime Minister uh, David Cameron. Of course, he later became a strong critic of how uh, Prime Minister uh, Theresa May uh, managed the uh, negotiating uh, strategy, and many of you will know him uh, for his resignation uh, in that context as well. Uh, so uh, our two speakers uh, this, uh, this morning are uh, close insiders of London, Dublin, and the Brussels uh, negotiating table, and we're really fortunate to have them uh, with us uh, this morning. And I think this is very much fitting uh, with the ethos of uh, the Brexit Institute, which as Ireland only and Europe First Centre specifically created to analyze Brexit, both from a research and a policy perspective, uh, is eager to bring together academics and uh, institutional players. And indeed, after two days of intensive academic exchange that, uh, as you know, will result in the publication of volume three of the book series entitled The Law and Politics of Brexit, uh, which I'm running at Oxford University Press. Well, after two days of academic talks, I think we now have the opportunity for a high level uh, institutional uh, engagement. And clearly the timing couldn't be uh, more ideal in light of the latest development, uh, the UK unilateral decision uh, to suspend part of the application of the Northern Ireland Protocol and the retaliation uh, in Brussels by the European Parliament that has decided uh, to put on hold uh, approval uh, and ratification of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. Uh, so without further ado, I suggest we immediately get uh, into the presentation by uh, Tom uh, and Ivan. Uh, if uh, the two speakers agree, I think Tom should probably go first uh, and uh, rules of engagement, 10 minutes each, and then we will have plenty of time for Q&A. Tom, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Federico, uh, and thank you for uh, inviting me along uh, to this uh, session. Um, it, it's an honor to share a platform with Sir Ivan. Um, I, I think, in fact, our paths overlapped in Brussels uh, some years ago, but I was in Cora for one uh, and Sir Ivan was in Cora for two, uh, and at times they are very different gal galaxies. Um, uh, and of course, now since Sir Ivan is now a very distinguished commentator uh, on uh, the issues we're discussing, whereas I, I have the privilege of still living the dream um, here in Brussels uh, in, in Cora for two, uh, and Sir Ivan is commenting on the dream, but sometimes it seems like a nightmare. Um, <laughs> Even although, I mean, I've dipped in and out this morning of the, of the discussions and I perhaps have some random thoughts picking up on some of the, uh, the points that were made this morning. Um, for, first of all, in relation to uh, the withdrawal agreement and the trade and cooperation agreement, on the trade and cooperation agreement uh, and uh, all its works and pumps, uh, we're, we're still awaiting uh, ratification. 
Um, the EU has, of course, asked for the extension of the ratification date to the end of April, uh, and we're uh, awaiting the consent now of the European Parliament. Uh, and in this period, the UK has asked that there be no meetings of the various bodies uh, under the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. So all, all of that area is still, to some extent, um, untested. Um, I mean, there, there was quite a lot of talk this morning about uh, the, the future relationship. And of course, ultimately, the future relationship between the UK uh, and the European Union will depend on the political willingness of both sides to enter into a close and cooperative relationship. Uh, all of these agreements won't work uh, unless we actually want them to work uh, and we are committed to them. Um, and to be honest, I think from the discussions here in Brussels, people are still trying to work out uh, the level and the degree of commitment uh, in London to the future relationship. Um, it, it is, there, there have been political statements from London saying uh, they want the best possible relationship with the close neighbours. But at times, some of the statements and some of the behaviour um, cast doubt on the level of commitment. Um, recently, here in Brussels, there have been meetings uh, of the Foreign, the Foreign Affairs Council and the General Affairs Council. And in both of those councils, the issue of the future relationship between the EU and the UK was discussed by ministers. Uh, and in both discussions, it was clear uh, from the, U the EU side that there is a desire for a close, ambitious, warm uh, relationship uh, and a recognition that a neighbour on our doorstep uh, that's chairing the G7 at the moment, that's going to host the, the Glasgow a Conference of Parties on Climate Change, that's a member of the Security Council and so on, we absolutely have to have as close a possible um, relationship. Um, but on the other hand, firstly, as was said earlier, in the area of common foreign and security policy, the UK declined uh, the offer of putting re the relationship on a, on a formal legal uh, footing. Um, and there, uh, I think there is some concern that the UK's preference might be for bilateralization of the relationships uh, and a focus, first of all, on developing closer bilateral relations with some of the larger capitals. Uh, and then secondly, um, having ad hoc relationships with constellations of member states, depending on the issue at stake, uh, and that the UK preference might be to go down that road rather than developing a broader relationship uh, with the European Union as, as such in Brussels. Uh, and secondly, uh, in the economic trade security area, uh, again, there is a desire on the EU side, I think, for a, a close cooperation. But then you hear these uh, voices in London uh, talking about changing the regulatory regime uh, to unleash uh, financial services in London um, to make the best of Brexit. Um, you hear talk of using uh, new genetic technologies uh, in agriculture now that um, the UK is freed from the EU's regulatory uh, regime. Um, you hear talk of using state subsidies for levelling up uh, and for supporting frontier technologies and so on. So a lot of the statements coming from London suggest that the UK uh, would want to be in a more competitive relationship uh, with the European Union than, than a cooperative one. Uh, and again, that gives cause for concern uh, and, and also results in a very strong focus by the EU side on the whole issue of level playing field, dynamic alignment uh, and so on. So I, I think we're probably, I mean, we're in the early phases of, of, of the departure of the UK. Uh, and we're still in Brussels waiting to see what direction uh, the global Britain will go in. Uh, and I, I think that the, the imminent publication of um, this UK uh, paper on the future of foreign security and defence policy, this integrated um, paper, uh, will, will be of, of interest. Um, secondly, I, I think, and I don't know whether it's fully appreciated in London, uh, the, the later stages of the negotiations uh, on the TCA were very much overshadowed on the EU side by the arrival of the pandemic uh, and intense discussions in Brussels on how to deal with this uh, in, a, in an area where you had free movement of goods, people, services and so on. Um, and the, the pandemic is, is having and going to have 
quite profound effects on the way the European Union uh, operates in the future. Uh, and one of the effects, uh, one from an Irish point of view that's, that's not so attractive, is now a very strong emphasis uh, internally in the European Union on this new concept uh, of strategic autonomy. Nobody quite knows what this means. Um, it, it seems to have meanings ranging from uh, resilience uh, along a spectrum uh, to protectionism. Uh, and it's resulted in a European Union which is increasingly inward looking uh, and more focused on uh, developing um, its own internal systems to be a, a, a global player, to be able to protect itself uh, in a world where globalization uh, is now in, date, in doubt, uh, to developing a new sort of more equal relationship with the United States, uh, to look to its relationship with China in a different way to the way in which the United States is looking uh, and so on. And in all of this discussion uh, on strategic autonomy and the role of the European Union, you don't really hear much talk of the role of the United Kingdom. Uh, and in, in fact, in, in, in the internal discussions uh, in, in, in the EU, it is to some extent striking uh, the degree to which the departure of the UK has almost now been, been forgotten, uh, if, if that's not too strong a word. Um, I think towards the closing phases of the negotiation last year, there was definitely a strong sense of exhaustion around the table uh, with all issues to do with the United Kingdom. Uh, and the fact that some of those issues are now still there is almost an irritant. There's a strong desire to move on, to look at bigger issues, to deal with the, the big economic challenges in the post-COVID world, uh, to look at the EU's strategic relationships with other big powers around the world. Uh, and of course, we want, um, there is a desire to, to have a good relationship with the UK, but it's, it's, it's definitely not up there among the top few issues that are under discussion um, in Brussels. Uh, and finally, just to mention, uh, in, the, in, the, in the negotiations of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, I, I think one, one issue, there are two, two points worth stressing. First of all, the European Union remained united in all of this throughout the negotiation, throughout the negotiations of the Withdrawal Agreement and of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. And it remained united almost to the surprise of itself. Um, and despite efforts by the United Kingdom uh, to, to divide the, UK, the, the EU uh, through, throughout the negotiations, the EU managed to remain united. Uh, and this has left a, a sort of a positive taste uh, in the EU. Uh, and the EU seems determined to remain united uh, on this. And also it's given the EU an appetite to become more united uh, on, on, on other issues. And secondly, the approach of the UK throughout the trade and cooperation agreement negotiations was quite confrontational, quite aggressive. Um, the word sovereignty was mentioned uh, again uh, and again. Um, Michel Barnier was very conscious of his mandate, but also conscious of the red lines set by the UK throughout the negotiations. Uh, and I think, to be honest, the approach of the UK throughout the negotiations has left a sour taste. Um, it, it hasn't, the negotiations did not end in, a, in an air of mutual celebration. Um, in Brussels, uh, the air at the end of it was disgruntled. It, it wasn't a happy ending. Um, and uh, the fact that the whole thing was concluded at a Corpor meeting on Christmas Day uh, it di didn't add to the, the, the joy of the occasion. Um, finally, just to mention, um, uh, and you mentioned it at the beginning, Federico, the protocol um, on, on Ireland, Northern Ireland. Um, we have had some recent difficulties uh, in the protocol. Um, I, I think for our side, uh, for, the, for the government in Dublin and also for the European Union, we are very strongly determined to make sure that the protocol is implemented fully uh, and effectively. It is seen as the solution agreed to by both sides uh, to have no hard border in, on the island of Ireland, to protect the integrity uh, of the single market uh, and Ireland's place in it, and to support the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, and it is the way forward. Um, that, so, that there are definitely problems arising from the implementation of the protocol, but they're not really problems arising from the protocol itself. 
There are problems arising from Brexit uh, and from the decisions that the UK took uh, on the nature of its future relationship uh, with the European Union. So, so some of these irritants around, around plants uh, and bulbs uh, and parcels and chilled meats uh, and so on that are causing problems in daily life in the North can be traced back um, to decisions, for example, the, the, the European Union did offer the UK the possibility of entering into a veterinary agreement uh, under which uh, there would be equivalence arrangements between the sanitary and phytosanitary regimes, but that was rejected by the UK because it would have obliged the UK to align uh, with EU SPS uh, regimes and also would have involved an element of ECJ judgments. And the fact there is no SPS agreement has made life considerably more difficult. Uh, if there was such an SPS agreement, we wouldn't be having these irritants uh, under the protocol. Uh, I, I think we very much regret that some of the problems that have been that are arising, they were under intense discussion through the structures of the withdrawal agreement in the Joint Committee and the Specialised uh, Committee. Um, and we were edging towards uh, agreements and arrangements when the UK um, decided instead uh, to go down this road of a unilateral declaration extending the grace periods uh, up to, to October, um, which in turn has obliged the Commission to start looking at legal remedies. But we very much hope uh, that in the coming weeks and months we will continue to discuss the issues in the Joint Committee and the Specialised Committee uh, and come to practical, pragmatic solutions to these issues, which are definitely there and are definitely irritants to the daily lives of, of, of people uh, in the North. Um, I, I leave it there, Federico, and I, I look forward to, to listening to uh, Sir Ivan. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tom, for your opening remarks and for setting the perspective from uh, Brussels and Dublin. Uh, and with, uh, without further ado, I'll move straight to Ivan for his own opening comments. Sir Ivan. Thanks very much, Federico, and uh, thanks very much for inviting me to this uh, excellent conference. I've thoroughly enjoyed what I've uh, heard so far. Needless to say, it's always difficult being the last person of all to speak at the conference because it's all been said, really. Very good to see Tom as well, uh, and uh, very good to hear his remarks. I'm uh, pleased to say I never managed to do a Karapa on Christmas Day on anything, so I'm sorry for, I'm sorry for you on that, above all on the Brexit question. Look, I mean, it's quite, there's quite a lot to be pessimistic about. Um, I'm not notorious for my optimism, I know, um, uh, although I think I would say that um, uh, events of the last few years, if not few decades, have demonstrated that it's more realism than pessimism. Uh, I think there are, uh, if I had to predict now, uh, I would expect a bumpy, difficult, mostly conflictual, not very harmonious few years ahead and I mean years not months. I think this will take a long time uh, to settle down if, if it ever does. It's complex and we've heard from many other speakers uh, the nature of the agreement and the extent to which the kind of rooms of the agreement have not really been filled. I have to say right at the outset my expectation is those rooms are not going to be filled in the next few years under a Boris Johnson government or with David Frost in the role he's in. So this idea Idea that you know there is a great deal of sort of incompleteness but there is scope within the framework of this deal to fill in the boxes yes that's true and that's no doubt deliberate on the other side of the table I just don't see it happening because there's no appetite in London for it to happen um, and the reappointment or the elevation of David Frost to cabinet level to carry on in this role is an indication that the style of the negotiation that he adopted during the uh, talks is not really going to change. Um, so I think we should be sober, realistic, have a very sensible uh, and probably rather downbeat assessment of what the next few years will entail. I'll try and end on a more um, optimistic or uplifting note and give some suggestions as to what on earth those of us who think that this has ended up as a rather thin deal uh, and a rather suboptimal deal for both parties should do about it, but let's not kid ourselves. I don't think the dynamic that led us to the agreement in December is going to change in 2021. I don't think the politics are changing here. And if anything, of course, the Prime Minister is in a much stronger position than he looked like being 
uh, even three months ago, six months ago, partly because of the vac primarily, I think, really because of the vaccination success relative to others. There was an opinion poll here last night which showed him 13, the Conservatives 13 points ahead of Labour. This is not a government in trouble. It's got rid of its most troublesome priest, uh, of the ex-chief of staff, Dominic Cummings. It appears to have got more of a grip. It's doing well on vaccinations. It's got no reason to change its fundamental approach to the European Union, and its fundamental approach to the European Union is not really going to be a friendly one. And I, I, I just want to say that in all honesty. Second point I want to make is we ended up with a relatively thin FTA, and, and candidly, that's exactly where on the morning of the 24th of June 2016, indeed well before the referendum, uh, I thought we would end up if we left. Um, now, we took some byways, mostly thanks to Theresa May and Ollie Robbins. I don't want to go there. I've said one or two other things um, uh, you know, in the last few years, and there's some more stuff um, in the pipeline with one or two of your sort of rivals or competitors, Federico, in terms of what happened and why it happened. But if you take the positions that we have taken, above all on free movement of people, um, uh, control of borders, uh, the role or otherwise of the European Court of Justice, uh, the need for a sovereign and autonomous trade policy and the need not to contribute to the EU budget on an ongoing basis, except for specific purposes, you can only end up with a relatively thin FTA. I mean, personally, I think that even with this negotiation, um, they mishandled it. And because they put all the emphasis both on sovereignty level playing field issues and on fish, they ended up with an even thinner, more inadequate FTA than I think we could have managed. But one of the reasons for my exit or one of the uh, immediate proximate causes for my exit was saying in October 2016 that the key people to whom I was talking around Brussels and Strasbourg and capitals at that point when listening to Theresa May's fateful um, party conference speech had concluded that if that was serious and her red lines were serious, we could only end up with a thin FTA. There was nothing deeper and more fundamental compatible with those red lines. Uh, as Bridget, I think in particular said, I, I, I agree with that assessment. She spent the 18 months after my resignation, not that my resignation has anything to do with it, gradually inching back because she realized the dramatic implications for the UK economy of having started in a position which she didn't understand when Nick Timothy wrote the speech for her. Um, uh, she gradually inched back to what became uh, the Mansion House speech in the, in the spring of 2018 and the Chequers uh, potential deal, internal deal of July 2018. But as Bridget also said, that's the point at which both David Davis and Boris Johnson quit. And from that point, she's really dead woman walking and the European Union leaders were right to think that she hadn't got a cat in hell's chance of getting her own version of Brexit through the House of Commons. It's just, it's just that we spent an inordinate amount of time proving it. Um, and then she only fell nine to 12 months later. And we ended up with Boris Johnson because no other person other than Boris Johnson could at that point have taken over. And Boris Johnson, I mean, sometimes he wears his ideology lightly and people say, you know, he, he um, isn't an ideologist of Brexit and chose this simply for career purposes in 2016 because it was his best route to the Conservative leadership. I don't buy that. I mean, I did work for him as Foreign Secretary. I heard him repeatedly internally as Foreign Secretary. This is a man who believed that the purpose of Brexit was radical divergence from the European Union model. And that remains the intention. We can come on to the, the question then of sovereignty and autonomy and what you do with that capacity to diverge. But that was always the Johnson vision. And Northern Ireland and the Irish border question was always, I mean, even secondary would be, you know, kind um, as a description of Johnson's preoccupation about this back in 2016. Um, he never wanted the Irish border question to dictate the shape of the Brexit that he delivered. And the Brexit he delivered was always going to be a thin free trade agreement, goods heavy and services light. Um, and was, uh, you know, he never wanted the Northern Ireland problem to dictate the shape of Brexit. 
And he was vehemently opposed to both her ideas, Ollie Robbins's ideas and Philip Hammond's ideas about potential quasi customs union arrangement from the very outset. So I don't think we should, I mean, this is all looking backwards and I want to look forwards, but we've ended up where I thought we would end up and it's deeply unsurprising. And I think we're going to stay there for a number of years, obviously under a different administration, different leadership um, and in a different sort of constellation, probably with a different commission, uh, you know, one might do something different, but please don't assume that we're on the verge of the fundamental economic interests of the economic operators you know, the CBIs and the Make UKs and the Institute of Directors and City UK suddenly reasserting themselves and the UK position changing back to what it was a bit more like what it was before 2016, because that is simply not going to happen under a Johnson government. Where does this leave us? Look, I think this deal, if I'm honest from the outside, I agree with a lot of what I've heard from this conference. It's, it's, it's fragile. Um, um, but I'm pleased that there is a deal as opposed to no deal. Uh, we risked at many points ending up with absolutely nothing and indeed the government uh, pointing in that direction. We've ended up with something which is a basis, it is a framework, and we have to see whether both the Partnership Council and the attendant technocratic committees can be made to work and whether the dispute resolution and arbitration mechanisms can be made to work. I think that's a big if. And I think this requires a lot of effort from both sides. And as others have said, I'm not sure it's going to get it from the British side because I don't think David Frost from the outset has ever been bought into the government superstructure that he's ended up with and ended up having to agree. Frost is certainly not a believer in the structure of technical committees that we've ended up with. And the question is if the, if the UK effectively, I'm not saying sabotages it, but finds a way essentially to void those of very serious content or ensures that there's no real connection between the technical and technocratic level and the political level, then we've got a big problem. And he's our guy in the end on the Joint Partnership Council, and he and the, the relationship between Frost and Shevkovitz will be crucial if we're ever to solve problems. My reservations about, I mean, I've got loads of reservations about the governance and dispute resolution mechanisms, although I'm not criticising anybody who came up to them. It's a, it's a complex process, and I can see why we ended up where we ended up. The difficulty as an old kind of trade bore and trade negotiator is if you end up with too many complex um, issues and difficult issues for both sides going to dispute resolution and the dispute resolution mechanism has to work at speed for the European Union side. That's why we've ended up with them having to go to arbitration panels much faster than in the WTO um, system. And that would be intolerable for France, Germany and others not to end up there. The difficulty is if you overload the dispute resolution mechanism, I think uh, the whole thing will capsize. Um, and I do think that's a serious possibility of a sort of 12 month time scale if it's overloaded. So I think it's incumbent on both sides to find ways to avoid overloading it. And that points to the intelligent, serious, sensible use of the Partnership Council. But that re requires, of course, an approach to the Partnership Council, which recognises that it is going to have to meet really pretty regularly and at principles level, not just at technical level. And it's going to have to find ways to diffuse disputes and prevent grenades going off rather than deliberately lobbing more grenades into this relationship. And as you've seen so far, both during the negotiation and this week, David Frost is very much minded to lob grenades into uh, the relationship. This week is a classic example. I mean, I predicted it again, that it would come. It, it always seemed to me that the UK was going to do what it did this week. It was never going to allow the, the uh, conversation to go on in the Partnership Council. I suspect agreement could have been, would have been reached in the Partnership Council to extend grace periods. The UK deliberately chose not to do it that way and deliberately chose to bust the agreement by unilaterally declaring that the grace periods would be extended. That tells you a lot about the political dynamics where I'm sitting. And in London, those political dynamics are not going to change. So you're going to get more of that from Frost and Johnson and Lewis and others, not less of it. So that all sounds like a council of despair, um, I know, and a kind of how does the union react? Because I can see then from the union's angle, you know, and I'm sure this is common to the member states and the European Parliament, not just the Commission. The reaction then is, of course, to sort of reach for infringement proceedings and say, OK, well, under the protocol, we can take you to the ECJ and that's what we'll do. And, and of course, that's what the Commission is now doing. 
And that will make matters worse. I mean, I'm not blaming them for doing it. That's, I think they're, they're inevitably going to do it. But I do think it will make matters worse and will get a toxic political counter reaction here. And I think, you know, Frost in particular, Particular knew perfectly well that that would be the reaction function of the European Commission, and he did it anyway. So we do have to face realities here that this is kind of very fragile, it's difficult, and the political incentives on the actors, probably at both ends, and certainly at this end, are not necessarily to make this more stable. And the same applies, of course, to the Northern Ireland Protocol. Look, there's a limit to what I can say in the time available about that. It's a long and difficult history of why we ended up where we ended up. Boris Johnson did indeed, as Bridget say, said, sign on something which his predecessor had, in my view, rightly said that no British Prime Minister could ever sign off on. She really did contort herself on the Northern Ireland issue and get very well acquainted with it. Sadly, in my view, rather too late in her time in office, but she did get her head round it. And it did, to a significant degree, um, constrain uh, the version of Brexit that she ultimately chose, but couldn't get through her own party. None of that applied to Boris Johnson. We ended up with a protocol which he grossly oversold and missold as a negotiating triumph. But is he wedded to the substance of the Northern Ireland protocol in the way that the other side of the table understands it? No, I don't believe he is. So that too is fragile. And the difficulty now, and you don't need me to tell you, is um, the, this is a genuinely constitutional issue. It's not simply a technical issue. I think Bertie Ahern rightly said that yesterday. The, these are highly sensitive questions and they're becoming more sensitive. Now you can argue, some will argue that some of this is attributable to the irresponsible statements of Boris Johnson and others, which have whipped up unionist sentiment and persuaded them that the protocol is something that they might yet be able to get rid of. Leave that aside, it's becoming more complex and more difficult and more contentious on the unionist side. Yeah. Um, and this might, um, this might get worse. So we now got an extremely delicate situation, which again needs extremely sensitive handling on both sides. And the experience of the last six, six to eight weeks has been very depressing. I mean, the commission made a fundamental error on the 13th floor of the Berlin Mall to come up with its Article 16 procedure. Okay, it withdrew it within hours, but it did a lot of damage even by thinking about it and visibly thinking about it. And what the UK is doing is no doubt exacerbating that situation. What do we do um, to end on a more positive note? As I say, let's be realistic about where we are. Let's be realistic about the kind of political incentives on both sides. Let's not be naive after the experience of the last four and a half, five years, and indeed arguably much longer, that all of this is about miraculously to change and we're going to love each other greatly in the next few years, because that isn't going to happen. But it does require a lot of work and a lot of choreography behind the scenes and a lot of thinking about what packages, mini packages, could be put together, both on the protocol and on the handling of, you know, some of the kind of easements and um, mitigations uh, uh, on the TCA and on the way in which that gets implemented. Um, it seems to me they're going to have to be mini packages built which have political buy-in, which give wins to both sides, which are saleable back home, which start to take uh, the heat out of the issue and start to make both sides believe that if they invest in the partnership council at the political level as well as at the technical level, they can make serious progress with each other. Now, that feels a long way off to me at the moment, but I don't see an alternative to it. As I say, I would... I'd be very worried. I do think, uh, Bridget and others again referred to it, I think that there's work going on around Whitehall. There is work going on around Whitehall to look at where we can reap competitive advantage from diverging. You can't stop that work on the European Union side of the table. Any UK government having done Brexit will instruct its civil servants to find ways now in which we can legislate and regulate to outcompete the European Union and take advantage. And let's be honest, the instructions that you will have, I'll stop in half a minute, uh, the instructions that you'll have as permanent representative uh, for the UK in Brussels or uh, the, key, the key people in London will be to say we are diverging, but we're not diverging in a way which subverts this agreement or subverts the single market. So there'll be a huge methodological dispute between the UK and the EU, uh, led no doubt by France on these issues. So there are lots of potential bust ups to come because I think 
from what I've heard from this audience, I think you're going to be surprised. I think the UK will find more areas to diverge and deliberately diverge to try and reap competitive advantage. And they won't just be in financial services or, or, or in the SPS area. I think it'll be wider than that. But we do have to find a set of mechanisms which enable people politically to have discussions, to diffuse the disputes that can be diffused and the bombs that can be diffused, and then to manage those that can't be where the two sides inevitably are going to compete with each other because they have different versions of, of what they want to do in the world. In the end, I'm a long-term optimist about this relationship because I think um, over a decade or two, and probably under different governments and different commissions, you know, we'll have to reach more accommodations and we will want to put more depth into the relationship, including on things like a labor mobility chapter where it makes eminent sense to revisit where we ended up, which doesn't make sense for either side. But I'm not a short-term optimist. And the only way to get from short-term gloom or pessimism to longer-term optimism is to start to build some things that work, which are practical, pragmatic, concrete, start to improve levels of trust, which let's be very honest with ourselves, levels of trust on both sides of the channel in the other partner are very low at the moment. And unless you do something about that, we're gonna go on in a very bumpy, relationship for the next several years. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Ivan, for those uh, pessimist or realist remarks, uh, depending on how you want to see them, but certainly very helpful to see things uh, from a British perspective. So without further ado, I want to open up the floor uh, for question and answer. We have over 20 minutes to do that. Uh, from a technical point of view, you can raise your hand uh, and then I will call your name and with the help of Catherine Martin, the project coordinator of the Brexit Institute, who I want to thank warmly for her technical support, we should be able to uh, unmute you uh, so that you can uh, speak. So please raise your hand if you want to take the opportunity uh, to ask question to either Tom or uh, Ivan. And Maybe just to break the ice as I wait for people to raise their hand, I, I'll abuse my role as chair uh, and take the opportunity to ask myself a question to both, uh, to both speaker, which is uh, what I call the Biden effect. We actually started the conference uh, yesterday afternoon uh, with an excellent presentation by uh, Michael Cox of, of LSE, uh, who, who explained the sort of the transatlantic context uh, within which Brexit is taking place and, and clearly uh, as he was emphasizing, the Biden victor, victory is, is a game changer to a large extent because he's a staunch supporter of, of the Good Friday Agreement, Belfast Good Friday Agreement and, and the protocol. So I'd be curious to uh, hear your views on, on whether action taken by the UK uh, yesterday will, be, will, will produce a response uh, in Washington, D.C. Actually, what Washington did yesterday was to lift uh, the uh, uh, subsidies um, on, on, on UK trade, so not, not quite exactly a strong answer to that. Of course, the, the two things are unconnected, but I'd be curious to have your views on that. Well, just quickly, look, I mean, I think it's, um, it's probably healthier all round uh, for multiple reasons well beyond this relationship that we have ended up with Biden, not Trump. I do think it was possible that I, if we'd had a Trump administration that Johnson would have walked from the table and we would have ended up with no deal because he would have been more encouraged in that direction by Trump. So I'm pleased that didn't happen. I was certainly worried in the early autumn, uh, late summer, early autumn, when certainly Downing Street thought that Trump would win again, that they might be tempted by that route. Actually, of course, from UK policy point of view, there is much more common ground with the Biden administration, including on um, you know, G7, D10, uh, COP26 issues. And those are big issues for Johnson in demonstrating there's some substance in global Britain in the next 12 months. I think the UK will tack much closer to the United States, still wants a trade deal. Um, others have said why it's, it's not prepared to go for on to ongoing uh, alignment on SPS. It knows very well that that would be unpalatable to the US uh, and would be a, a free trade agreement killer with the US if it did so. So David Frost is never going to sign up to long term alignment on SPS for that very reason. The UK believes, I think, that in the long term, it will be closer to the US on issues like China than the European Union will be. Um, that's already visible, I think, on China, Hong Kong, and that, that may be true more broadly. And geostrategically, it may be more aligned with uh, the US than with the EU. And actually, Biden will find that the relationship with the UK is stronger and easier than his relationship with France and Germany. 
And as Tom rightly said, um, and others have said, I think through this conference, this is a government that thinks about relations between um, sovereign powers, and it certainly thinks about bilateralism within the EU. It, one thing you're going to notice over the next few months, and you'll see it, I think, first in this uh, in this integrated uh, integrated review, is it won't talk much about the EU at all on anything. It'll talk about states and sovereign states. One of its commitments internally, and I know this from old Whitehall friends, is to stop mentioning the EU and start mentioning kind of key states and key friends and key key global alliances. It's a uh, it's not clear, completely about delegitimizing the EU, but it's about saying we have a vision of the world and sovereign states acting in the world, which doesn't really have a place for the for the European Union in it. Tom, you want to comment on this as well? Yeah, th th thank you, Federico. Um, I mean, as Sir Ivan has said, the relationship between the United States and the UK uh, is very wide and deep and covers many, many issues uh, and not just the Good Friday Agreement. Um, that said, however, uh, the president has made clear both during the election campaign and since he was elected, his own personal deep committed uh, to preserving the Good Friday Agreement. And, and of course, it's not just the president. Uh, within Congress itself, uh, there are very strong and powerful voices supportive uh, of, of the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, and I, I think they will continue uh, to play a strong role. Uh, and also, I mean, I, while the UK-US relationship is, is very broad and deep, as I've said, that the Biden administration uh, has already gone out of its way to emphasize the importance of its relationship with the European Union. Um, the Secretary of State addressed uh, foreign ministers at the last Foreign Affairs Council, uh, and we hear repeatedly uh, from the Biden administration the need for the US uh, to reset um, uh, strengthen its relationship with the EU uh, and, the, and the trade disputes that have been there are under intensive discussion uh, and there is progress being made uh, and on the EU side the, the, the European Council has already set out the various pillars that it would like to see um, embedded in its in the EU's future relationship with the US so from a global perspective the EU US relationship will also be very important um, I, I would imagine, uh, in relation to the protocol uh, and the Good Friday Agreement, uh, that London will have to be conscious of the powerful voices in the US watching all of this um, and, and take it into account uh, in considering their future moves. Thank you, Tom. Um, we have two questions by Rebecca Christie and then Bridget Laffan. So I'll, ask, I'll take them uh, in, in a row and then we'll go back to the speaker. Rebecca. Thanks very much. Hi, I really enjoyed your presentations and it's nice to see your faces again. Uh, I wanted to ask about the role of the financial services sector and the city. And specifically, if Europe will, if you think that Europe will be looking deliberately to minimize dependence on London, regardless of where we end up in equivalence and trade like that, does the EU have a strong incentive to diversify among the third countries that it works with financially? Or is there still kind of a desire, or at least a, a willingness to let inertia hold and keep working with London, even though it's more expensive, and more complicated now? Um, I bet you both um, have different views on that. So I'd be really interested in how it looks. Thanks. Thank you, Rebecca. Bridget? If, if I could ask, I have a question both, both for Sir Ivan and the ambassadors. So Sir Ivan, when do you think there might be the political space for the kinds of mini packages that you talk about? Because certainly it strikes me there's not much space now. So what sort of, are we a year or whatever? So the, the opportunity structure and then ambassador, how vigilant are the member states going to be about the TCA and its implementation? Are they going to watch very carefully for divergence, for potential threat, competition? In other words, how seized of the agreement will they be over the next period? Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Um, maybe we'll start with Tom now, if that's fine. Um, thank you, Federico. Um, first of all, on, on financial services, um, when the UK was a, a member, I mean, London was a clear asset for the European Union. 
uh, with its wide and deep pools of capital uh, and the expertise in a huge range of financial services. Um, now, now that the UK has gone, um, the, the whole issue I mentioned earlier of EU strategic autonomy has also come into play. Uh, and the European Union, uh, among for many member states, um, is looking at the issue, first of all, um, from the perspective of, of regulatory control. Um, many member states are uncomfortable with the idea that the EU should be reliant on a huge capital market over which uh, it's going to have relatively little regulatory influence. Um, secondly, on strategic autonomy, um, many member states are now of the view that the European Union itself should have uh, resort to its own financial capacity uh, and deepen its own capital markets union. Um, and therefore, I, I think there is an appetite to try and repatriate quite a significant chunk of the financial services industry into the European Union. So I, I wouldn't be entirely over optimistic uh, that there will be a, a strong equivalence regime in the future or that this promised memorandum of understanding will lead to uh, very strong and positive developments in the relationship between the two sides on financial services. Uh, and secondly, in relation to Bridget's question uh, on the trade and cooperation agreement, the European Union is setting itself up to be extremely vigilant in relation to the implementation of the agreement. Um, the internal structures are being established uh, to make sure there is strong internal coherence that there is strong monitoring of developments in the United Kingdom, uh, that those developments can be discussed uh, in the European Union uh, and that action can be taken if necessary. Um, there is quite a detailed process, uh, institutional types discussion going on as to how internally the European Union will arrange itself to make sure that it can fully avail of the the, process, the procedures uh, and institutions of the TCA, if necessary, uh, and there will be very strong vigilance over the actions uh, of the UK uh, in the economic and trade area in particular in future. Ivan, do you want to follow up? Sure. Um, look, on financial services, I, I share that essential view. I think I'm quite pessimistic about where this ends up on equivalence and exactly what would be in the memorandum of understanding. I have been along with Jonathan Hill for about the last four or five years on this and saying so to uh, both the Treasury and the Bank of England. Nobody, nobody much listening as far as I can see. Um, uh, I always thought it would be thin. Look, to be very clear, because I'm a Treasury person by origin, I never thought we could end up in an EEA type relationship with, uh, with uh, the EU. Unlike, for example, David Frost, who publicly uh, advocated being in such a relationship. Um, I knew from Treasury and Bank of England background and concerns about financial stability issues that that was not a runner uh, and was never going to be a runner. So I totally understand the Andrew Bailey position. I don't agree with his view at the Mansion House speech of the other night about what the EU is doing on equivalence regimes, because it seems to me to be doing exactly in relation to us what it would do and has done in relation to other countries. And I think that's a view shared by Jonathan Hill and others who used to take equivalence decisions. I think this is difficult. Look, the difficulty on financial services is this is no longer an entirely, it probably never has been, an entirely sort of rational economic debate about what would be optimal. I don't like the language of strategic autonomy, but it's inevitably a reaction to a sovereignist argument advanced by us, and it's an understandable argument. And when I was negotiating the kind of Cameron package uh, on the renegotiation, financial services, financial stability, and the relationship between the Eurozone and the single market countries outside the Eurozone was central. And one of the things that I repeatedly said to Cameron and Osborne was, this is all immensely difficult, even when we're together in the single market, but we're outside the monetary union. And there are huge tensions between monetary union interests and our interests. But when you're outside the town walls altogether and you've left the European Union, uh, you could very easily be completely screwed. So it doesn't surprise me we're here. I don't agree with the Bailey account of why we're here or the behavior on the other side. I'm not very optimistic about where it ends up. I don't think this is necessarily very rational policy from the EU side because I think there's real risks for them 
in seeing fragmentation around multiple capitals. And I think the real risk for them is actually a lot of the, the a lot of London activity disappears to New York or to the Far East and goes nowhere near the European Union. But we're not in that world. We're in a politicized and political world we're and a sovereignty versus strategic autonomy world. And that's not a brilliant place to be in terms of uh, the future economic prosperity of either the continent or the UK. But we are where we are. I hope again over time, that between regulators and supervisors and sort of sensible people behind the scenes, you could start to put Humpty Dumpty back together again and do some sensible, sensible things. But there's no political appetite to do some sensible things here at the moment. And I don't think there will be much on the other side. Bridges question about could you get to mini packages? Does the politics permit it? Look, it doesn't feel like it at the moment. It feels the opposite. Um, the question is, can you, you know, can you make a modest start somewhere with doing some things on both sides, which would have to be reciprocated because you couldn't make a unilateral gesture without being hammered by your own side for doing it. So Frost can't do that and won't risk it, but nor can Shevkovitz. So it does need a kind of deep discussion or, you know, and it's a difficult one to have of, you know, if I found a way to move things on this, and I don't know, this could be bivalve mollusks for all I know. I mean, it might well be. Um, but you've got to find one or two things where you really push the boat and you push the member states on the EU side. And Frost really pushes his internal constituency on our side and saying, oh, well, let's put together something here, which gives us, you know, gives us both a couple of modest wins. Um, now, I think it's genuinely very difficult to do. And at the moment, we're not in a world where it seems to me there's much appetite on either side to think like that. But if you don't think like that, this is only going to get worse, I think. Um, and the mood will worsen and we'll, people will take a more sort of litigious response to each other. And then we'll have the European Parliament not only stalling ratification, but saying it refuses to ratify. And then you're heading towards another full bone crisis where you could still end up with no deal. And in the end, this is not a sensible place to end up. So it's risky for both major players. This is why, you know, the choice of Frost may make it more difficult because he's got no political background and pedigree and suddenly been elevated to the cabinet. Whereas you could imagine Michael Gove um, having the confidence to think, well, actually, we need to build one or two things here that were not in the original agreement. But somehow, I mean, I, I agree with you. I'm pessimistic about this happening in the next few months, but I think people should think very hard about how they might make it happen and what would be some emblematic gestures of goodwill on both sides that would enable you to start unfreezing the ice a bit. Thanks, Ivan and Tom. We still have five more minutes. I'm looking around to see if there are uh, any other questions. Uh, one point you just mentioned, um, Ivan, about the ratification by the European Parliament or lack of ratification and possible uh, no deal, I think is very interesting. I see also Danuta Hoopner from the Constitutional Affairs Committee in the audience. I don't know whether she wants to step in, but certainly if I can maybe uh, take the chance and, and ask a question to Tom um, from, uh, from the conversation he is, is, he is having in Brussels. Uh, a legal, very interesting legal question is to what extent can the council further prolong the provisional application of the TCA? It was already extended for two extra months uh, just weeks ago uh, because the parliament didn't have time uh, to, um, to, uh, to check the text in all uh, translation. We now have the provisional application till end of April, but the suspension just yesterday by the parliament uh, raises, uh, as, as Ivan was saying, the risk of a no deal in, uh, in less than two months. So I wonder whether the council has taken up or Carper has considered the possibility of further extending and whether that raises legal issues. Um, and thanks, Federico. The, the, the date for the uh, ratification of the TCA is actually set in the agreement itself uh, and it was originally the end of February. So in order to extend it, it required the agreement of both sides. Um, and in theory, uh, the agreement of the Partnership Council, which was actually done in writing. So the, the UK agreed somewhat reluctantly uh, to extend the date to the end of April. So now it's actually a, a sort of a, a date set in the treaty. Uh, and it, it can only be changed with the agreement of the, of the UK. Uh, and it, it was the strong intention of the European Union uh, to ratify by the end of April. 
Um, the situation here is that yesterday the Conference of Presidents of the European Parliament was due to meet to confirm that their consent vote would take place uh, towards the end of March. Uh, and what they did was simply defer the decision as to when the consent vote would take place. They, di they didn't actually say we're not going to consent, they just deferred the decision as to when the vote would be taken. So it's, it's not quite we're refusing to ratify or anything like that. Uh, and I, I think the Commission is making the argument that it's much better for the European Union to go ahead and ratify the TCA because the TCA contains all these mechanisms about arbitration and dispute settlement, and it would be better to have them in place rather than not. Uh, so at the, at the moment, we're, we're facing a, a potential European Parliament vote in April, unless something else happens to, to further destabilize the situation. Thanks, Tom, for clarifying that. I don't know, Ivan, do you want to add anything on this specific no, no. point? Okay, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we are coming to uh, the end of a fascinating discussion. Uh, it's, uh, it's exactly, uh, well, 2.30 Brussels time, 1.30 London time. Uh, I am extremely grateful to Sir Ivan Rogers and Ambassador Tom Honey for accepting to join us. Uh, and conclude this book conference. This is the third book conference of the Brexit Institute and will result in volume three of the Law and Politics of Brexit series. So I would encourage everyone uh, to keep their eyes up for the volume which will be published uh, by Oxford University Press uh, later uh, this, uh, this year. The only thing that I think we can say with certainty at the end uh, of uh, two days of intense exchange and conversation is that Brexit remains a process uh, an ongoing and painful process. Uh, it's not coming to an end. Perhaps the only winner of this is the Brexit Institute uh, that has the opportunity to continue to organize uh, events and uh, undertake its mission of raising awareness uh, on uh, uh, those uh, important developments. So I would like to take once again the opportunity to thank all the speakers, uh, all the participants, uh, as well as, of course, all the sponsors of the Brexit Institute, uh, Geska, Stockman, Luxembourg, uh, Grant Thornton and AIB, as well as I shall acknowledge uh, the European Commission, which is funding partially the Institute uh, through the Erasmus Plus uh, program for the bridge project we are running. Uh, obviously the help of our sponsor is crucial to allowing the Institute to undertake uh, its uh, uh, mission. Uh, and what I will only say as a final word is please stay tuned uh, with the Institute. We have an intense series of activities coming up uh, in the next few months already uh, in April with a high level event featuring a commissioner. Uh, so this is uh, uh, just the end of the conference, but certainly not the end of our activities. And I very much look forward to further opportunities uh, to meeting and engaging uh, with you. So I wish you a lovely weekend until soon.